instead I give you a brief brief introduction um, to about two topics in international management. No? So that was our ideal. And um, yeah, so so that I will do this. The first part will be today. And then, then in one week, we will have then the second part. And um, it's, it's a snapshot. It's an introduction to international management. Of course, international management is a much broader subject than just the two uh, short lectures that I can give to you. Um, I have a few slides which you can then also share later on and uh, you can also interrupt me every time during the lecture and we have a discussion. Actually, it's a lot more fun if you ask me questions. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions in between. So, okay, now I need to share my screen. How we do this? Okay, so you should see my screen right now yes okay let me then start the powerpoint okay so this is from um what i usually teach in our master's program when i give the students a brief introduction into international management it's a sort of refresher of what students should already know uh, from the bachelor and um, the idea is that we in the first step, I want to explain to you what type of internationalization strategies exist. And I compare two types of diversification strategies. I call them um, the, the sprinkler model and the, uh, the waterfall model, this one, and the sprinkler model. Huh? So that is the two types of internationalization that are also discussed a lot in the literature. Huh? Um, so what is internationalization? Internationalization is about how a firm internationalizes its processes. Um, it's, uh, and process can be everything. So it's not only about its products, its marketing, it's also about its production, its um, so, well, sourcing, so, so um, purchasing, um, and many other parts of the value chain, no? but usually people associated with the internationalization of the, well, of the products, of selling your products abroad. And um, why is this important? Um, why, why is it important to internationalize? Well, um, at some point in time, your own country might be too small. You, you need to internationalize because, yeah, otherwise you do not reach the sufficient scale to, to stay, um, well, to, to earn enough money to, to, to support your, um, so that you can cover your costs. No? So, so sometimes it's a necessity. You have to internationalize in order to, to survive. No? And in particular, if you, if you have a very, very specialized product, you're operating in a niche. No? You are a niche market player, a firm that's uh, only doing uh, one uh, particular, you no, know, only active in one particular business segment for very high quality products. If you do not internationalize, you will never become profitable. So it's a sort of a must. <laughs> you know, for some firms, it's a must. For other firms, it's maybe not a must. It's just a way to grow and, um, yeah, become, uh, you know, ultimately grow your business and also your your sales and your profits. Um, so that's about the need for internationalization. And then we have two strategies, how a firm can internationalize. And, and just looking at this model here, so we have the waterfall model and we have the sprinkler model. Who has an idea what this is about? You know, I'd like to also make this interactive a little bit. So who wants to say something? In Germany, I sometimes then pick students if they don't say anything. Okay, nobody wants to say something, um, but uh, Halnya, if so I see you, maybe you want to say something. Oh, um, unfortunately, I'm not a student. <laughs> ah, you're not a student. Oh, but you still I'm can so say so something. <laughs> okay, so if, if, if there's no students in there that want to no, say anything. Yeah, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Talk to me. So what, what, what are the two, what are the differences? Can you hear me? Or, two models? Okay. I can hear you. Yes, perfect. Um, yeah, good. Okay. 
uh, I'm sorry, you, you came up with some questions. Can, can you repeat it, please? So I, I first of all discuss the need to internationalize, why you internationalize, no? why your firm becomes international. And now I, I go one step ahead and I want to, to talk to you about two ways of internationalization. So we have the waterfall model, which is here on the screen, and we have the sprinkler model, which is here on the screen. And maybe you can, can, can elaborate a little bit or you have an idea what this means. What I what do I want like to it, describe it's, it's with that? It's obviously, it's obviously first of all, uh, attending one region, understanding its roots, its law, its policy, whatever. Then mm -hmm. develop this this particular like new region, understanding people, understanding the market, understanding everything. Then when this um, this region is how to say maybe automated, when all the processes are are mm -hmm. done, are all the manual processes are done you are going to the next step to the next exactly. region and you when it comes, yeah. when it comes about uh, when when it comes to the next model you showed i think it's it's, it's much much more complicated because uh, i think to develop this region you have to develop uh, you have to divide them on some some groups maybe by um, by market um, similarity or whatever Mm -hmm. maybe by, by language maybe it can be one one country but like you divided it in different regions for example what would be um, which country okay us for example okay. us usa yeah usa whatever uh you can divide it in your four regions five regions ten regions whatever and enter all the regions in, in one time but uh, as you say, it's a huge country and uh, each state has its own policy, its own laws. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to like, study all of them and that's it. Okay, let me comment this a little bit. Um, the first model you described, yeah, very, very well. Um, so you start with, by the way, when we talk about region here, we mean um, yeah, we could also say country or group of countries. We're not on the level within the country. Maybe I should have said that, but but it's just uh, here. So we're talking about country or group of countries and then going to the next group of countries, etc. And the idea of the uh, waterfall model is exactly as you describe. You start with one country or one group of countries and then you uh, build your presence there. You learn about uh, how it works in this market. You set up your marketing processes. You, you establish relations with the customers and only years later or maybe months depending on the industry but you typically years only then you move to the next region or next country or next group of countries now so you go you, you do it stepwise not simultaneously you do it sequentially one after another and the this whole well, yeah, the waterfall model is is uh, coming from maybe you know this also from the uh, research stream, um, the Uppsala model. It's called it's called Uppsala because there's a Swedish university town called Uppsala, and they um, developed this stepwise process of internationalization. They looked at how IKEA internationalized. No, IKEA is a Swedish company. So, so IKEA was then founded in Sweden. And then the founder, um, which, which died, I think, two, three years ago, um, then they uh, moved from Sweden to Denmark to Norway and then from Norway and Denmark they moved to Germany and, and Switzerland and Austria and then from from Germany Switzerland Austria they moved to let's say France and Italy no? so, so the the and they didn't enter all the markets at the same point in time but one after another uh, and, and and exactly as you described no? the idea is that you go always to a market that is relatively similar to your to the last market which you have entered. No? So that's why they moved from Denmark to Sweden, uh, from from Sweden to Denmark because yeah, the Swedish and the Danish culture are relatively similar. Both are Nordic countries. They're also very close by in terms of 
um, geographical distance. Um, so it's relatively easy to enter Denmark from Sweden. And when once you have understood the Danish market and you have uh, set up your, your uh, factory or your, your subsidiaries there or your sales uh, stores there, then you can enter Germany, which is the neighbor of Denmark. And um, Germany is maybe culturally closer to Denmark than culturally closer to Sweden. I'm not so sure about that, but it's still not, you're not, you're not moving from Sweden to India or from Sweden to China. No? So still Germany is relatively close in terms of the culture to the Nordic culture. Um, no? So and, and only when you've understood how the German market and this Germany and Switzerland and Austria are in the same cluster, I would say. Only if you've understood that, you would then move maybe to, uh, I think they moved at that point in time to the south of Europe, which is then a different group of countries which, which have different cultures and uh, traditions and, and uh, yeah, also how, uh, how the consumers uh, think and, and work. And so that's the idea of the Uppsala model step by step. Um, and, and what's the main advantage of doing so? Maybe somebody could could explain this. Why did IKEA do it like that? And I mean, they could have moved from Sweden right away to the US, to India, to China. I mean, today they are in all of these countries present. But why did they decide to go from Sweden to Denmark <laughs> and from Denmark then to Germany? It's much easier. I, I just don't understand the point why, why exactly Denmark, why not Norway or... Oh, yeah, um, okay, Norway. Finland. I think Finland is a bit different in terms of the culture. The language is pretty different. Maybe, but, but much Finland easier about logistics, transportation and so on. I, I agree. So so the point is they moved to the Nordic countries and from to the other Nordic countries and from there they moved to the, west, to the middle and Western Europe and um, from there to Southern Europe, if I'm not wrong. Um, anyway, that's just an example. Huh? But what is the advantage of doing this in a sequential way? Why, why do you want to do similarity, it? Similarity. Similarity of uh, the culture, so you don't need to change too much uh, in your products. The language is similar. Less, less, uh, wasting less resources. For example, like uh, logistics, uh, yes, so the, geographically, geographically. Yes, exactly. So the investment, so yeah. the investments and the money that you have to put on the table to to enter the the market is lower as compared to going abroad to 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 on the other well abroad, but on the other side of the world. Um, no, so so that's the that's the idea why the Uppsala model um, has some. Yeah, resource advantages. No? It's also a bit risk averse, um, but it takes time. It takes time, and um, but on the other hand, you learn. You learn in between how the market works, how the new market, the new foreign market works, and then you can use this learning to enter the next market. No? So it's a really a sequential step by step way, and and this, um, yeah. The, this, these types of internationalization strategies, some people call them waterfall strategies. Some people say this is the Uppsala model of internationalization, but, but that's, that is what, what people have researched in international management actually quite, for quite some time. No? So that, but, but then things uh, kind of have changed. We also now have a situation where firms right away from their inception, from their end, from their beginning, want to internationalize and uh, enter many markets at the same point in time. No, simultaneously, so you you go not you're not going from Sweden to Denmark, but ra rather you go from Sweden to Denmark. But at the same time, you go to France, to to Spain, to Eastern Europe, uh, to maybe the US, and and maybe also to China. So the, so you and, and these firms are called when you when you do it as a young firm, so as a, as a startup, these called these firms are called born globals. I think I have it here. So born globals are firm that internationalize right from the beginning. And um, they, they enter many, many international markets right from the beginning. And uh, yeah, why, why? What is the advantage of doing this <laughs> compared to the Uppsala model? I mean, why do you want to do uh, uh, 
yeah, the sprinkler model of internationalization. Why, uh, why, what is the advantage of, of doing this? And why you sometimes have to do it? I mean, you're sometimes forced to do it, even like that. When you don't, uh, don't pr produce and provide goods, but service, which you can deliver just in, in a moment, through internet or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's yes, much, technology much helps you. It's yeah, it's much, true. much faster and easier to spread your company like mm -hmm. in in in, uh, in one time in different regions. Okay, and it's also important when this for when or uh, whether your product has um, multi -lang multi language like option, so you can switch languages. Mm -hmm. Or your uh, product, uh, and also if your product is um, like needed in all in, in all, the, all the countries, mm -hmm. it it's a, a good way to earn a huge amount of money. Like, okay, so, so so you mentioned already several points. Let me try to to put them into different uh, arguments or categorize them. So first, you say okay. Technology has has made our life easier in that regard. I mean, the internet, in particular, with services, now makes it possible to deliver your service. Uh, well, depending on what type of service, but if you think about translation services, or if you think about editing services, you know, publishing companies, uh, um, for example, use editing services. Um, if you think about ser or programming services, IT services, um, this. You can offer your services via the internet everywhere. So technology has changed the game in this regard. No? So that is your first um, argument. Um, your second argument, I would frame it a bit differently. You argued, yeah, if you have a multi-language option right from the beginning, then yeah, okay. But that, that takes time to develop this multi-language option. The best thing would be you don't need to have <laughs> several languages. I mean, um, with some services, it's anyway done in English, like we teach here in English today. Um, so I can easily internationalize um, if everybody agrees on the same language. And let's formulate it differently. If you don't need to change the product, if the product stays the same, if you don't need to adapt the product to the new market, so it can be the language, but it can also be the design or the functionality or whatever the product is about. Um, if you don't need to adapt the product, you can, well, internationalize right away because yeah, there's not much needed in terms of adaptation of the product. So the less you need to adopt the product, to adapt the product to the new market, well, the, the easier it is to follow an internationalization strategy in the way of the sprinkler. No, so, so the sprinkler strategy would, would then be appropriate. That depends always on how much you need to adapt the product to the new market because each product adaptation costs you money. And that's that's more or less the logic. Yeah. No, so we have technology that helps it, and we have the, the the need for product adaptation. Maybe that need is low, and then a sprinkler strategy is possible. And then I have a third argument in mind. Um, I'm not so sure whether you have come across that terminology ter terminology or um, term yet. Um, we have the situation that some products are so-called network products, um, so that network externalities exist. Um, maybe, maybe somebody else. What is a network externality? Anybody has a clue? What is a network externality? Maybe if you've heard, uh, if you had already a microeconomics class, then this um, term should sound familiar. No? Okay. Let me... Maybe it's like when customer itself gives um, and like shares with the product with other customers, with new customers mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. So like when you when the, when the when the the product itself shares through customers, not using some additional 
mm-hmm. traditional instrument. Also recalling microeconomics, if I'm not mistaken, uh, yes. it, it also refers to when the utility of the product yes. or specific services increases, um, like the same way as the number of the users yes. who are a part of this network. That's 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 so both of you are right. Um, in an economic sense, it's exactly what you described. And in a sociological sense, uh, it's what your colleague described. So in an economic sense, a network externality means the value of the product or the utility of the product increases the more people use the product. So um, the early examples were fax machines um, or telephones. Um, when I have a fax machine, I can send faxes to myself, but there's not much value in this. No? So, but the value of my fax machine or my telephone or my WhatsApp group or well, many other products in, in today's world uh, increases the more other people also have yeah, access to the product or use the product. No? And that's called a positive network externality. Um, so the the base of users, the number of users that use a product matters a lot because the more people use the product, the higher is the value of the product. And uh, that's in an economic sense, a network externality. And what your colleague was referring to is um, social networks between people that one person introduces the good to another person via, we would call this in marketing, word of mouth, word of mouth marketing. So it's uh, marketing that goes from one person to another person by a recommendation, for example. No, you say, look, this is a great product. I tried it out. I can recommend it to you. And then the the marketing is is done yeah, by your customers and they introduce the product to new customers. No? So that's word of mouth marketing. It's both about networks, but one is about takes a marketing sociological perspective and the other one takes a microeconomic perspective. Um, here, my argument is, is more about the economics perspective at the moment. So I argue when you have a network product, so a product that where the value increases, the more people it use, uses the product. So then it really makes sense to, to target the entire world right away. <laughs> so, so then it's, it's really a good idea to go into, uh, to go into the, 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 the Southern European market and the Western European market and the Eastern European market and the Northern European market at the same point in time, because yeah, you benefit from a higher number of users. Uh, I mean, uh, if you can see it very nicely in uh, with one product that I have in mind, maybe you all know LinkedIn. It's a Microsoft product now, um, but it was at one point in time actually a startup um, that is was bought by Microsoft. Um, you all know LinkedIn, and what you maybe don't know is that we had in Germany also a social network called Xing. Well, we still have it, but. Um, I'm not so sure if it will survive, unfortunately. Um, so I was an early Xing user. So I used Xing. That was what we did in Germany at that point in time. And that you could connect to friends and uh, business partners via this social network. But it was only very positive, uh, very widely used in the German market, Germany, Austria, and, and Switzerland. There, the, it, it had a market share of 80% or 70%, really high. But LinkedIn was used everywhere in the world <laughs> except the German market. And well, network externalities are, of course, in favor of LinkedIn in the long run. I mean, in the long run, LinkedIn, uh, it, it, you could predict it um, that, that now the German market switches as well, step, step by step. Um, people uh, now register with LinkedIn and uh, yeah, do not use Xing anymore. And that's the power of network effects. I mean, LinkedIn has 
not only a powerful uh, mother company, Microsoft, but they also have uh, a larger installed base of users. So, so it's hard to compete against them. And, and that's the, the, the strength or the, the power of network effects. And in order to, to make use of it, you need to enter many markets at the same point in time. So then, and going back to our internationalization strategy, it, once you have such a network product or a product with network externalities, where you don't need to change the product a lot from market to market, um, and, and the additional costs of entering a new market are maybe also not very high, in particular with, with software and IT, um, then, yeah, then it makes sense to, to target the entire world um, at, at once. <laughs> you don't need to wait for one market to, to successfully complete one market to enter into the next market. No? So, so we have the two, two options. We have the waterfall model here, makes sense for very capital intensive products, for products where you need to adapt the, uh, the design and the, the marketing and, and everything um, to the local market. Um, and we have this alternative here for products where not much adaptation is needed and where network effects play a very important role. Well, now you can think, no, which, what is your product? What is your company? Which, which internationalization strategy makes sense for you? So that, that's what I want to achieve uh, more or less here in the beginning of the slides. I want to, to give you some, some arguments when you discuss about internationalization strategies. Okay. That was actually the first part of my lecture today. The question is how, how much time do I have? I mean, I could go, go on. And <laughs> so where, where are we and how much time is, is left? I mean, we also have a lecture next week, but, but I can, can also go on a little bit if you want. Uh, still 20 minutes. Um... Okay, we have 20 minutes. Okay, let's see what I still have to offer. Now here's the example of IKEA um, that I gave to you. Um, no, that that example was uh, was used uh, by the researchers in the Swedish city called Uppsala to develop this Uppsala model of internationalization. And you can see here the timeline. Okay, actually, they entered Norway first and then Denmark. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I mixed the two countries in the order. Anyway, Norway and Denmark, the 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 language is pretty similar. Once you, I was last last year in Sweden when you were uh, the Swedish understand the Danish and the Nor Nor Norwegians also understand both of them. But Finland is different. Finland has a different uh, language. And then Switzerland, Germany at same point in time. Okay, Born Global. So these are firms that are right away international from the very beginning. Um, yes, then we have, okay, here we compare the Uppsala and the Born Global model of internationalization. I mean, you, you see, see the, the main points that are already made, I think, um, here. Um, summarized in a table. Um, I think the mode of, I can briefly talk about the mode of entry mode. So maybe we can pick up on this um, next week, then in the second part of the lecture. So the next step is once you have decided that you want to internationalize, you have to decide about your mode of entry. So how do you enter? Um, the new market. No? So, so there are different ways how to enter a market. And, and some, some ways are very risky, very cost intensive, and other ways are more flexible. And then we distinguish in the international management literature, we distinguish between um, non-equity and equity modes of market entry. And um, the equity means you invest in the foreign countries by setting up a new firm there or by acquiring a new firm there. Um, 
So you or you build up a subsidiary there. So that's these are the equity modes of market entry. And the non-equity modes of market entry is you just ship your product there. <laughs> you, or you ship your product via the internet there if it's a service. Or you have a partner there that licenses your product. So that, for example, with franchising, this could be the case. No, so, so these are the non-equity modes of market entry. No, we have equity modes of market entry. You set up a new firm there. You may team up with another partner, with a local partner there to, to build a joint venture. Joint venture means that you set up a joint company together with a local partner. Um, Good question, but your university is affiliated with an American university. Are you a joint venture? <laughs> I'm not so sure about that, but no, the idea is the same. You you have two companies that form a third company and uh, in order to explore a new market and the uh, local company is then part of this joint venture and the um, well, the foreign con company is then also part of this joint venture. And then the question is who owns the majority of shares? Um, so you can either have majority with the foreign partner or majority with the local partner. And that's something that sometimes you have no choice. For example, German firms, when they wanted to enter the Chinese market, the Chinese said, look, when you want to, to enter our market, you have to do it via a joint venture with a Chinese uh, local firm. We don't allow you uh, to enter our market on your own. You have to do it with a joint venture partner from, uh, from China. Um, and I think it was even minority, so they they had to be stay minority, but but I don't know that. So regulation can play a role there. So they force you more or less to do it via a joint venture. Um, um, if that regulation is not there, you can uh, maybe choose to do it via an own subsidiary. And then the question is, how do you? get this own subsidiary and then there are two options you can either uh, set it up completely on your own that's called a greenfield um, mode of market entry so you put your, your subsidiary your factory on the green field and you're the complete owner of this uh, um, entity um, the alternative is you acquire a local firm and um, yeah, you are owner then of a local firm that has already existed um, before. That's um, also a way to enter a new market. Also. And, and these are still equity modes of market entry. You set up something in a foreign country. So a legal entity is created. Um, well, and the non-equity modes of market entry are... Um, yeah, we can discuss about the pros and cons. No? Maybe that's something we could uh, start today and then um, do uh, next week as well. Um, so the non-equity modes of market entry, yeah, you simply export your products, you ship your products from your home country to the foreign country. And then we have also be distinguished between direct imports and indirect imports. So you sometimes do this directly or you or you do it via an intermediary. So, so a local firm that works for you there and sells the products through its sales channels. Um, so that's export or you have a contractual agreement. As I said, um, you could look for a local partner who licenses your product and produces it there under your name. Uh, or maybe even under their name, that is a question of negotiation. Um, and that's a contractual agreement, um, but there's no legal new, new legal entity created in this foreign market. Okay, these are the two types of um, market entry modes that you have. Um, yeah, I could now ask some questions, but Olga, you are... <laughs> You demuted yourself. Yes, you're telling me I should stop. <laughs> what is the time? Uh, okay, uh, so still fifteen. Oh, okay. Then we can have. So, so why do you go for equity and the non-equity modes? That's now my question. Huh? So, so what are the advantages of going to via an equity mode 
as compared to non-equity modes. Now I have described to you the two ways of market entry. So what speaks for an equity mode and what speaks against an equity mode um, to do it via a non-equity mode? Who wants to say something? Yes, Elizabeth. Yeah, I think that uh, some uh, like uh, non-equity modes are maybe more simple to organize. It's, for example, just export, and it's like less costly than the equity modes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and more flexible. So, and more flexible, yeah, no? not, less costly, yeah. more flexible, more easier to organize. I think these are the main arguments. I would say. Um, now you just you just ship your products from your home country to another country if it's a physical product. Um, so you need to organize the logistics um, that you can contract out and you can use services for that uh, from other firms. Um, but still, I mean, if the market, the other market is not attractive, then you just stop it and then you go to another market. So, so you're very flexible. So, so that is the, uh, that's, that's the thing. You, you don't invest into a f setting up a firm in a foreign country, which is, which is pretty, which can be pretty costly, which can take a lot of time. You need to find uh, a local partner. Maybe you need to find a, a place, a good place uh, where you can set up your subsidiary. Um, you need to hire a local people there. You maybe have to send your own people to to the foreign market. You no, know, we, we call this ex expatriates. You know? um, so you have uh, yeah a lot of things to organize that takes a lot of time that is pretty costly and and just shipping your products is much more flexible no so that's the argument in favor of the non-equity mode yeah anything you want to add uh, alex i think well, I, well i'm not in the s one i just want to add that about equity mode you are sharing risk so you 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 leave less risk for yourself if other company, other whatever takes risk. Yeah, but uh, only with the joint venture. If you do it completely on your own via a greenfield investment, then you don't share the risks. But with the yeah, joint sure. venture, you share the risks. Yes. Yeah, sure. yeah, you share the risks, but you also share the knowledge. <laughs> That's the negative yeah. aspect. Now as huh? one came and I just have to only listen. Because you won't hear me at all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so you share the risks with the joint venture. Um, yes, but not with the wholly owned subsidiary. Yes. Um, so share that that's an argument maybe uh, with the equity joint venture. Um, any other arguments to to take it? Jaroslav, I think you have. Um, yes, for equity, I think that uh, if you're teaming up with a local company, they may know the market better, therefore yes. your products uh, could sell exponentially higher. Yes, absolutely. In my opinion. Absolutely. So the local partner brings, and that's now the resource-based view, the local partner brings in an additional resource. And um, this resource could be that they understand the market, that they understand the customer, that they can hire easier people there. No, so that is that speaks for a joint venture versus a wholly owned subsidiary. And um, it, but then okay, now but now you always compare one equity mode against another equity mode. I'm, I'm a, if you want to compare, let's say, an equity mode against a non-equity mode, so exporting against setting up a business, there, there are even some other there, there are some other arguments. Maybe somebody has an idea, additional idea. Yes, Elizabeth. Uh, yes, uh, the equity mode can be like investment in the future of the company. Mm -hmm. Like when you go global in this way, so you have your, for example, subsidiary in another company, you organize it and you uh, like, uh, like pay money for it, you invest in this, and then it will like 
give you more profit than mm -hmm. if you're yep. just expert. Okay, so it's a long, you, you, you can see it as an investment. Yes, right. You can see it as an investment. It's a long term investment. It may not pay off in the short term, but in the long term, this is really a commitment. This is a commitment to a particular um, country. And um, actually, this commitment may pay off in the long run that people really buy your products because you have a local presence in the foreign country. You can offer them services. You can uh, display your products better in the subsidiary. And, and there's no intermediary in between who sells your products. You can, you can simply display your products the way you want them to be displayed. You have more control over it. Um, you know, so the, but but you see it as a long term investment, and and maybe you want to do these long term investments for the for for very important large markets, you know, which for, for for those markets you want to do the long term investment. You do an equity mode, and maybe for other markets which you consider okay, uh, these markets are interesting, but not so super interesting. So on a priority, second level priority, there I maybe do the exporting. Yeah, so you can mix the two strategies. That's that's maybe the lesson I want to also give you. You can mix the two strategies of market entry. For some countries you apply equity mode. For other countries you apply non equity mode. Um, and of course, it's an investment, and this investment may pay off in the long run you know, because customers may actually value the fact that they can uh, get services uh, from you directly in their home country. Um, yes. Uh, what else? Um, the more the product, I think, needs to be adapted, the better it is to have a local presence. You know? So the more. I mean, if, if the product is the same all over the world, then you can simply produce it in, in your home country and ship it all over the world. Um, but the more you need to adapt the product, the better it is also to have a local presence, I think, um, because you understand then the market better, what they want. You have direct interaction with customers. Uh, you may actually produce it also there. So that's a big deal at the moment for many German uh, firms. They are somehow forced to invest in the U.S. Because the U.S. says, look, we want, we are a super great market. We give you subsidies if you invest in our countries. If you set up some factories here, we want, you no, know, made America great again. We want a new, uh, new uh, investments in our country. So uh, we actually force you to do an equity mode of market entry. Uh, so sometimes it's it's not not a big choice. Uh, you you have to do it like that. I know it, for example, also my, my, my brother is actually working in a windmill mill producer. You know, so it's a, a, one of the largest producers of windmills and, and they have a factory in Brazil. They have the factory not because they they like Brazil so much. <laughs> the reason is the, the Brazilian government says, look, if you want to sell all your windmills here, you have to also produce them here. We want local content. <laughs> And uh, so the factory is, uh, or the company is uh, forced to, to set up a factory in, in this case, Brazil to sell their windmills uh, in Brazil. I mean, uh, I don't know, they maybe would have liked to ship them just from Germany to Brazil via <laughs> a ship, but um, there was no choice. They had to, to build a factory there. And sometimes regulation plan can play an important role. That's what I want to make this point. No? So the, the more governments introduced reg, regulations that you have to produce local, the more the, the more the duties on the customs are increased, um, the then exporting becomes less attractive. So you have then to produce locally in the foreign country. No? And that's what we see at the moment, what the US is doing. They want to um, to attract foreign investment in their country. So they change the rules a little bit. So in that sense, Mr. Biden is not so much different than Mr. Trump. Okay, any other points? I think the resources that you have to commit are quite different. No, Non-equity mode is less 
cost intensive, more flexible. You may use it maybe not for the super important markets. Um, equity modes are more costly, take more time, less flexible. I mean, once you have set up a company, it's not so easy to just close it down. Uh, at least costs a lot of money if you simply uh, stop it then. Um, so, so these are the two well, pros and cons that you have. Um, yeah, and that, that was my point for the second part of the lecture today. I want to, to give you again some arguments why equity, why non-equity modes of market entry. Okay, but now I think I've filled up the, <laughs> the time. Yeah, uh, the time is uh, yes. running out. Uh, so, uh, dear our students, uh, guest, uh, do you have uh, any question uh, to our guest professor? Yeah, it's difficult to hear you. Maybe it's maybe closer to the so microphone. Do you have any? Are you quite uh, in English in three right now? Because I don't know what to choose. Uh, Olga, did you get it? I, I can't. Uh, yes, maybe uh, maybe it's long better. Long. It's better for me to do it down. In yeah, you can write it in the chat if you want. Yeah, we have a chat. I didn't look in so far in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, please, uh, there are uh, a few questions uh, in the chat there, uh, yes. Uh, ah, yeah, there are questions, yeah, yeah. So the second, that we can go through them anyway. Yeah, if uh, you can just... Okay, so my question is how to check how favorable a country is in order to expand your business in it. Okay, that's what we do then next week. <laughs> next week we select the, the markets. No? So then we choose uh, whether the Danish market is more attractive than the Swedish market or the, the German market versus the Italian market. Uh, so it's about the country selection, right? But that's that's not an easy question. So I, I will, I can't, uh, I mean, you have economic criteria, you have cultural criteria, you have a lot of criteria that you can take to, uh, that you can can use to, to compare markets against each other. No? Um, okay, next question. What is your one main rule when you internationalize your company? There is, I think, not one main rule. Um, there are several rules. I mean, you shouldn't run out of out of resources. So if you internationalize too fast, you may actually uh, also go bankrupt because you simply um, run out of resources. Um, yeah, because it costs a lot of money So to, to internationalize. So then you may want to go for the Uppsala model. And then you have the other rule. However, if you do not internationalize fast and if you are in a market with, let's say, network externalities, then you, well, in the long run, you will be taken over by your competitors. No? So there is uh, always um, different rules, I would say. <laughs> That's a good question. What is the chance to be caught in Frankfurt Espan? Yeah, in, in, in Munich, I would say uh, the chances, in, in Berlin, I would say the chance is 90%. I don't know how it is in Frankfurt. Um, so better buy a ticket. Um, <laughs> good, good question. Um, so there, there are different uh, cities in Germany. Yeah. May the sprinkler market entry strategy be considered as the tool of being ahead of the competitors? Um, yeah, I think that's right. It's um, uh, in a particular, if network externalities are, very, are there, you it's simply a not a question of whether you do it, but how fast you do it. And if your competitors are doing it, you have no choice. You also need to do it. Um, <laughs> okay, 50-50, get caught or not. Do you provide any courses in English in Trier? Yes, I do. Um, actually, in the afternoon today, I will uh, also meet some students uh, from Ukraine and introduce my program in Trier. Um, and uh, what we teach there is, internet, is innovation management and uh, strategy, strategy, strategic management. Okay. I think I okay. answered the questions from yes. the chat. Um, yeah. Uh, Dr. John Block, thank you very much for your time that uh, you found to meet uh, with um, our students. Uh, thank you very much for so 
interesting lecture. We appreciate it uh, you, a lot and hope uh, to see you the next time, March the 28th. Yes, but then at nine o'clock my time. Yeah? Uh, up to you. Nine? No, 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 no. But we should just avoid that we have the, the okay. same. Okay, we will discuss. No, so ti ten, 10 your time is nine my time. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Right. Let me have a look. I think it's because it was still in the, I think in the wrong. So please, everyone who is present now, you may just put into your calendar uh, the next lecture time and date. Uh, the yes. students and faculty. Thank you, Jorn. <laughs> um. Okay, it's okay. I no next next Tuesday. No, that's okay. Then we do it nine o'clock. I just move it now from mm -hmm. 10 to nine. So it is nine o'clock my time and yeah. 10 o'clock Ukrainian, okay. Ukrainian time. Ukrainian yeah? time, yeah. Okay, we have one hour time difference. Yeah, so we made this mistake today. So dear participants, we are waiting for you next Tuesday, 10 o'clock Ukrainian time, nine o'clock European time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so then see you next week. See you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, same link. Thank I think, you. Yeah.